So let us now turn to our scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Again, that's Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Give you a moment to turn there. And Jesus said this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us go to Him in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we've spent the first quarter of the year going through Jesus's high priestly prayer found in John 17. And now we're going to spend a a few weeks going through Jesus's teaching on prayer here in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Jesus's Sermon on the Mount is is found in the Gospel of Matthew in chapters 5 through 7. And so this Uh, When Jesus begins talking about prayer here in chapter 6, it's part of that Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, what you should know about it is, it's not a description of requirements for entering the kingdom of God. Jesus is teaching here to those who have already decided to follow him. He's teaching to his disciples, to followers. Now, What Jesus teaches in his Sermon on the Mount isn't also an idealistic description of the way life will function after God has fully established his kingdom in the future. Rather, Jesus is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount, including the teaching we read today on prayer and the readings we'll do on the Lord's Prayer in the coming week, His teachings are a description of what life looks like for a regenerated believer, a follower of Jesus in this life as we try to be faithful to God. Ultimately, it describes what life should look like for a heart transformed by the gospel. What a heart looks like that stands in the grace of God. So here in in, in chapter 6, on this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches about religious practice and he teaches about wealth. And both of them he demonstrates for the believer, for the follower, where one's allegiances or loyalties ultimately rest. Jesus urges in both areas, in religious practices and in wealth, for believers to find satisfaction and security in God alone and in nothing else. See, prayer is an integral part of the life of a Christian. And it was an integral part in the life of Pharisees and Jewish believers and the Jewish people. And the religious practices had become a sense of importance, a way people found their security was in the doing of things and not the resting in God. And the same is true about wealth and money and finances that those afford us to purchase worldly things. And so we seek security and satisfaction in them, but they were never created for that. And so Jesus in his sermon here is attempting to reorient us and reorient the believers and the followers and saying, your heart has been transformed by the gospel. So focus your eyes upon the one who gives you complete satisfaction and who guards your security. And so Jesus teaches his disciples that he has an expectation for them to pray and how to pray. 
Jesus himself exemplifies a life full of prayer, going off alone time and in the garden. And we even heard his prayer with the Father in John 17. Here in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus critiques the Pharisees and the Gentiles. He critiques their external religion, one that is on the outside and does not represent or doesn't reflect their heart that is attuned to God. He critiques giving. He critiques prayer. He critiques fasting. But Jesus doesn't go and tell his disciples not to worry about those things. But rather, he explains to them that those are to be done with a different purpose. With their eyes on God and not the approval of man. For you see, as redeemed people, Beloved sons and daughters, as Christians, followers of Jesus, our living is not to impress others. Our living is to please and glorify God in all that we do. For when we were enemies of God, at war and rebelling against God and His ways, He knew you and loved you. And with our sin, needing an atonement, needing to bridge the gap, the chasm that we caused by our distancing ourselves from God, by our sin, turning away from Him, needing an atonement. While we were enemies of God, He sent Jesus. While we were yet sinners, to die on a cross for our sins. He shed his blood as an atonement, satisfying God's justice for all of our sins. And three days later, he was resurrected, sealing the covenant of redemption. And so it is because Jesus saves us, because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, because God loves us, that our heart, our energy, our focus, our attention, our all, is on the triune God and not on this world. So let's look at what Jesus teaches about prayer before he goes in to teaching us the Lord's Prayer. In verse 5, he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Jesus begins teaching us about prayer by stating matter-of-factly that the purpose of prayer is not so we will be admired by others. That he goes straight into the heart condition of why do you pray? What is your motivation to pray? What is your motivation when you're out in a restaurant? and you choose to pray before your meal, is it so that others will see you and think, oh, look at those wonderful Christians over there? Or is your purpose in your heart motivating you to give thanks to God for all that you have? This is Jesus' ultimate question here in his line of teaching. He's not against praying with people and praying in public. It's about our heart. It's about our purpose, our motivation, for God knows our heart. We can't hide it from him. He knows if our prayer was made to impress others or if our prayer was an earnest heart conversing with the Father. Jesus says, for the hypocrite, he desires to stand out, to be exalted for their superior piety and zealousness and devotion in their faith. But remember, he's teaching this to followers, and so he's saying, don't be like them. That the purpose of our prayer is to talk with God. So he says in verse 6, he says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Now, Jesus begins teaching us how to pray. He, he first gives us the example of the external religion that seeks to be admired and glorified by man. And he says, for public prayer to have any effectiveness, you must have your own private prayer life. That it's our private prayer life that informs any public interaction and prayer with others. Not the other way around. It's not our public prayer life that then goes and informs and develops our private prayer life. It's our private prayer life that then develops into a rich prayer life when we get with others. And it may appear that Jesus is slamming public prayer and exalting private prayer, but that's not the case. But rather, it's that lean into the heart to refocus the followers and the believers to go and get away from the distractions that distract you in the world, to go into a place alone and shut the door where no one else can hear you, where your audience isn't there, but your audience is with God. For you see, because of what Christ accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection, we have obtained access to God and stand in grace. So we don't have to worry about the audience of others. It's the very prayer out of Psalm 19 that that we pray every Sunday before the sermon. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. It's for the audience of one that he says our prayers are to be designed for. Because in the secret place, when we are alone with God, We feel safe to talk about what's on our heart. Not worried that others may hear exactly how bad we think we are and all the places we've messed up in a society and a culture that is Instagram perfect and Instagram model all the time. But we can be our true selves because God knows our true selves. He knows our heart. He knows where we've messed up. He knows where we struggle. He knows And he wants to talk to us about it. He wants us to let him in to have that conversation. And the reason Jesus teaches us to go and tells us to go into the secret place is because that's the place we're best equipped to have that conversation in private with him. Not seeking the attention and approval of the world, we will be our most honest. And he says in there, The Father that sees in secret will also reward you. Not with the applause of man. Not with law. Not with judgment, justice, or wrath. He'll reward you with grace. He'll reward you with a deeper relationship with him, the Father. Matthew Henry once said, You may soon find a living man who does not breathe as a living Christian who does not pray. Essentially what he's saying here is that it is impossible to find a Christian, a believer who is not engaged in prayer with the Father. So how is your prayer life? How is your heart in prayer? Why do you pray? Jesus continues his teaching in verse 7, and he says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. It's pretty straightforward here when he says, The length of our prayers do not measure their worth. That that's not what prayer is. It doesn't have to be this long prayer filled with words. Again, who are you trying to impress? But more importantly, when he gets here and he says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles or the pagans do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. He's even talking about a mantra. Prayer is not a mantra that's repeated over and over until you go into a state of subconscious. It is a fellowship on earth with our heavenly Father. 
For you see what the Gentiles do, according to Jesus, with their many words, with their long prayers, with their mantras repeated over and over, was an attempt to manipulate God. Why do you pray long prayers? Are you trying to show God just how worthy you are, how holy you are, how godly you are, in an attempt to manipulate him to get what you want? Now, while Jesus cautions against many words and rambling and repeated phrases, he's not saying long prayers are bad. Again, it's your heart. What are you trying to accomplish? What is your purpose behind it? Because as Jesus himself went off to pray all night long. But his point is true. that The length of your prayer does not measure its effectiveness. Remember, at your worst, when you were most needy of grace, while we were yet sinners, God planned ultimate good for us. When we didn't deserve it, when we had no right to it, when we were deserving of wrath and justice and judgment upon us, God planned ultimate good for us, loving us as Jesus died on the cross so that we might be at peace with God and stand in grace before him. Much more than, much more can we then expect God's unfailing goodness in our lives if when at our worst he saved us for his utmost that even today as his redeemed people, as his beloved adopted sons and daughters, much more does he care for you and your good. And as Jesus says, when he finishes up his teaching here, he says, do not be like them. The Gentiles, the hypocrites, the Pharisees. For your Father knows what you need before you ask. The Father knows. He knows what you need. He also knows what you want. But He knows what you need before you even ask. And Jesus said that God approves and rewards His children for what we need. And God has already been better to us than we ever deserved. But he will continue to be good to us beyond what we can ever conceive. This is the truth. God always cares about you, his beloved child. He cares about your needs. Do not doubt his goodness, even when you don't understand his providences. There are things we cannot understand, things that are inexplicable this side of glory. Yes, it's true. But this is the ultimate truth. As Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Folks, your God loves you. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from your heart. Not to impress others, but so that he can have a deeper relationship with you. We give thanks to God for that. Amen.